Catholic schools, have, as all of us here know, have done an enormous amount of good. And I myself am very grateful for the years that I spent in uh, several Catholic schools when I was a boy. Worldwide, the church educates some 50 million young people, and here in the United States, roughly 2 million souls. Uh, as uh, I was thinking about uh, coming to this evening, I re recalled a statistic I had read not long ago. Uh, so here's another good, you might say. And did you know that Catholic parents and principals and foundations save the taxpayers of Pennsylvania quite a lot of coin? Do you know how much? Can you hear now? It's, I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's $2.26 billion. Not bad. Let me tell you, if I ever became governor of Pennsylvania, <laughs> one, of the, one of the items of my platform would be to argue for a fair redistribution of funds when it comes to education. We live, I think, under a very unjust uh, sort of rule when it comes to study. Nevertheless, in recent decades, however, these same Catholic schools have suffered severe losses both in their religious identities and in their power to attract young people and retain them. Let me throw a few statistics your way. There was a recent survey of several hundred Catholic school teachers, and say, and this is roughly nationally representative. Now to the question, uh, where do we get bishops from? A third, so let me get this correct, barely a third, so not quite one out of three, knew that bishops are, quote, successors to the apostles. Not quite one out of three knew that. A little better than half thought that the primary purpose of the Mass is, quote, to celebrate community and diversity. Also, in the past 10 years, Catholic schools lost about 20% of their students. 20, uh, last year, 27 new schools opened and 88 closed or consolidated. Now, lest we think this is simply an American phenomenon, and uh, Good Father is already laid up my, the, the car that I'm a Canadian. Well, I'll tell you about Canadian Catholic schools, uh, as I, I was studying them not so long ago. Students, listen to this, students in Catholic schools are more likely to believe in God than their public school counterparts, and be pro-life, so that's good. They're also more likely to smoke weed and fornicate. I don't know how those all go together, but they do. My friends, Brothers and sisters, our playgrounds are, in many corners, overrun by weeds and snakes. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we need to learn how to restate the case, among other things. If we're going to learn to restate the case, if we're going to see renewal in our schools and in our homes, if we're to secure a future for Catholic education, even more than endowments, and we do need endowments, what we need is renewal of our hearts and of our minds. We need to renew our thinking about thinking, about the purposes of learning. So let's start with this. And we're going to open with a text. Now, I've simply asserted that there are three purposes for learning. I think you can argue that case well, I think there are sound analytic reasons that would favor that belief. But in this case, we also have a church document to look to, which is always nice. So I'd like you, if you have a handout, take a look at that. And if you don't mind, if we could read that together. This is from Vatican II's document on education. So here we go, number two. True education is directed towards the formation of the human person in view of his final end, happiness, and the good of that society to which he belongs, culture, and in the duties of which he will, as an adult, have a share, virtue. Now, by the way, what was in square brackets, it belongs to me. That's not in the text. Here's, here's a gloss. 
First of all, all education aims at some ultimate goal, what the text here calls our final end. Each of us, if you're a mom or a dad or a parent, will have a child, especially if you're a parent, and you're going to shoot them somewhere, your quiver's full, where are they going to land? That's what the text is talking about. Ultimate things. Second, education is also inevitably going to lead a student to something closer than heaven or hell or purgatory. There's a lot in between. And this proximate good, this thing that's closer than the last thing, is not quite happiness, but the good that you will share with other people. The bonum so chietata, what the text has, and I'm going to gloss that by calling it culture, a term we'll come back to. Third, more concretely, in order to achieve this good with others, this social good, and in order to get to heaven, which is the big good, any boy and every, every boy and every girl has to know all sorts of other things to help them along their way. So these are virtues. And what is a virtue? That sounds like an exciting word. You should open this up. You should be here. What is a virtue? You want to throw out a definition? Yes, sister. That's that's it. A virtue is a habitus, a habit, a pattern of action. Habits or virtues can be moral, but they're not necessarily explicitly moral. So, for example, if you are training your intellectual virtues, that might include learning how to read well or write well. It could also include learning to be kind and, and generous and so forth. But the, the concept of virtue is very broad. Basically, any skill that you acquire, moral, intellectual, or practical. So we're ready to begin. Let's start at the top with happiness. Happiness. Hmm. It's what everybody wants. It's what advertisers appeal to when they put Molson cans beside pretty ladies. Happiness. A Mother Teresa, like a Hugh Hefner, or a 30-year-old video game addict, seeks happiness. <laughs> the difference between the saint and the slouch is a disagreement over what will bring them happiness, what will carry them over to joy. And here immediately we catch sight of our first predator. I'm going to call this the thistle. This weed blocks out our vision. We know that if we press a conversation about ultimate things, about happiness, we're going to get cut. People don't want to go there. At least not usually. We're timid. Because we know, if we go there, we start talking about ultimate things, because we know we'll get prickled, then we tend to avoid the question altogether. But I don't think it's possible. Ends are unavoidable. Why? Education is not a thing. It is a method. The Latin word behind education, educo, means simply to instruct or to, to pull out. It's a process, in other words, by which some potency within a child, within an old man, a woman, any of us, is moved from something there but not activated <coughs> to something that is realized and happening. As a discipline, then, education takes its lead from other masters like philosophy, theology, or politics. Education can no more act on its own, you might say, than can a hammer apart from the hand swinging it. This is to say nothing against our hammer. 
It's only that where it should strike, how it should pull, when it should stay, is derived from some other source, from the builder, the mind of the builder. So when we teach or study, what do we intend to build? That's easy. A human being. To teach, to teach is to shape a man or a woman. Well, what is a human being? That's a difficult question, to be sure, and one that invariably brings conflict. And yet, to avoid the question, to stay away from the patch of thistles, is really, I think, to accept a lazy mental habit. If you are a Catholic, you have an answer. A man is a child of God. We are free because intelligent, responsible because free, impaired because of sin, glorious because of redemption. Now, Buddhists and atheists will take quite opposing views. In education, you have no choice but to choose. Education is and always has been a battle between the gods, you may say. For two generations, teachers have been taught, at least in some places, to say things like they wish children to explore their own values. I don't think this is very honest. Teaching is violent. Every act of instruction is an incursion upon a living organism. A living organism that you hope to change through that encounter. So whether your school preaches multiculturalism or militarism, whether you wish the boys to be tolerant or tough, you cannot avoid preaching the cause. In short, to educate is to act, and to act is to work from the basis of some ultimate principle stated or implied. For unlike monkeys and spirits, or rocks and stars for that matter, neither Sally nor Peter nor Billy nor Muhammad contains within himself all that is needed for his perfection. Homo sapiens is almost endlessly malleable. The same cradle can beget monsters and tyrants just as well as saints and citizens. The boy or girl, and to a lesser extent the college freshman, as we might say, still have formed. Obviously, teachers want the well-being of their pupils. Where debate lies is over what being well means. So we might ask, why is it that many principals and teachers, sometimes even at Catholic schools, shy away from explicitly defending the church's dogma, or dogmas about what it means to be a human being. In other words, if asking questions about ends seems inevitable, you can't avoid the question, why do we shy away, even if we're Catholic? Well, the story comes to mind. A friend of ours was recently touring a Catholic school she has several, they have several children, and they're wondering, well, should we stick them into this school? So they're on this tour, and as the mother was walking around the, the hallways, there, there was a group of others also walking with a guide, and uh, one of these other parents asked about the school's Catholic identity. This lady was asking things like, well, uh, or sorry, the mother, uh, my friend, was, was wanting to ask, about Catholic identity, and she's going to ask, well, what portion of the faculty are practicing Catholics? Do the, do the kids learn about saints? Are there saints days that are celebrated? And things like this. Well, just as she was about to speak, another mother raised her voice and asked, hey, we're not Catholic. Is that okay if we come to this school? Which is a reasonable question. How would you answer? Yes. I think I would do. Yes, you can come. You are welcome. The school is open to everyone. Well, the guide, at least reported to me by our friend, said something along these lines. 
She said, oh, uh, it's fine if you come. Don't worry about it at all. At all. You're not going to feel uncomfortable. Don't worry. We're not like that anymore. Now, when my friend, our friend heard this reply, don't worry, we're not like that anymore, immediately more questions were thrown up for her. Well, what do you mean we're not like that anymore? And, and I wonder about that question. Someone to ask, I teach at a Catholic college, and we have, you don't have to be Catholic to show up, by any means, meaning as a student. Um, I think it's a reasonable question to reflect on, and there are different ways you could answer that. But let me say at least this, I am quite confident that malls are meant to be welcoming places for absolutely anybody. The decor is pastel, the music is soft, the fake plants are green. Everyone can be happy there at some, at some level. I'm not sure that everyone should feel comfortable in just that same way when walking into a Catholic school. A deeper question, why was this guy so self-deprecating? And why are we so often scared, scared off by these thistles? Why not be proud of our rosaries and cassocks, our catechisms and scapulars? Well, in the case of some of us, I think this reticence often has less to do with rejecting, let's say, the apostolic succession or the hypostatic union or some other doctrine like that, it has more to do, I think, with being skeptical about the very idea of a dogma. Many of us doubt whether certain knowledge about final ends is possible at all. And we're content to say we're not like that anymore. Well, interestingly, when John Paul II was interviewing a group of American bis bishops who were visiting in Rome, he spoke to them about Catholic education, and he articulated what he thought was undermining Catholic education in this country. Now, in the mid-90s, there's, there's a graph. I did present a PowerPoint, uh, a sequence of slides, where I've given a version of this talk with it before, but uh, look at this beautiful handout with color. This is just this is marvelous. I sent them something black and white and fuzzy, and it came out clear. Uh, so if you, if you flip to the back here, you see graph number one. Uh, this gives a little uh, visual snapshot showing, plotting the, the, the relationship between the number of Catholic students in Catholic, or, sorry, the number of students in Catholic schools in the U.S. and the number of Catholics in the country. Okay. You see how there's a peak in 1965 or so. At that point, there were about 5.5 million students. And today, obviously there are quite a few more Catholics in the country, but the number of students we have and are able to sustain is the same number as we had roughly in 1930. So there's this dramatic drop-off. And when John Paul was giving this advice, we were, uh, we were a dec you know, 15 years or so back, so it wasn't quite as dramatic as now, but everyone could see where it was going. Well, this is what he said. Let's read again together from quotation number three. This is John Paul II's advice. Together. The greatest challenge to Catholic education in the United States today, and the greatest contribution that authentically Catholic education can make to American culture, is to restore to that culture the conviction that human beings can grasp the truth of things. And in grasping that truth, can know their duties to God, to themselves, and to their neighbors. It's quite uh, thoughtful. Well, my friends, I think that most of our neighbors lack hope in this respect. They think happiness is something merely internal, merely subjective, even if they're Christian. On this question of happiness and what ultimate ends, the ultimate ends are, John Paul was warning that. If you accept skepticism about final things, you bring into your school a kind of asset that will eat away at everything. And sooner or later, the foundations, even if the walls look good, will have crumbled. It tears away our confidence. For many of our contemporaries, our Lord's maxim seems to have been turned on its head. 
instead of thinking that truth will set us free, some of us were convinced that freedom will make us true. And I think perhaps we should be more skeptical from that point of view. Is it really the case that freedom will make us true? Where did this idea come from? This bad idea that happiness is just what you think it is. <laughs> Whatever you will it to be is happiness. I suppose originally, hiding behind those weeds is the serpent himself. Think here of Milton's Lucifer, I will make a heaven out of hell. Super Bowl fans, fans heard it set to music a few years back when Beyonce was paid, can you believe this? Four million dollars was reading this, four million dollars to swing her hips while singing live now, live for now, live for now. Boy, if I could sing like that, four million dollars, I'd learn to poke up. <laughs> in educational circles, though, its origin lies in a more remote corner in the thought of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And I'd like to introduce him to you briefly. Skipping now the second good, culture, we're going to jump to virtue. The third purpose of Catholic education. Up until the 18th century, oh, how are you doing? Fine. All right, I should take a drink. We drove down from near Boston. I brought my son with me this time, which is very pleasant. We could talk and I could stay awake. And uh, I, I got Peter to read the lecture out to me so I could hear what it sounded like and try to erase some of the dumb things that I was saying. I didn't catch them all. And at this point, he stopped and he asked, right, right here, Daddy, is there an intermission? <laughs> but, um, no, I don't think there is, but, but maybe we should have one. So I'll take a drink and then we'll move on. Up until the 18th century, we're now speaking about virtue. <coughs> Western civilization looked at men and women through the common lens of Christ. For Catholics and Protestants, for the righteous and the wicked alike, Death, judgment, heaven, hell framed the border of common image. Divine in his origin, tarnished in his fall, hopeful in his resurrection. All Christian educators debated details, they did not debate the ends. So, whatever conclusions about the curriculum, Augustine or Luther or Erasmus or Montaigne or Newman or Montessori or your grandfather's first grade teacher, they have held separately, homo, man, they held in common. And that's not true anymore. The terms of disagreement among educators gradually began to shift during the Enlightenment, and I think most forcibly with the publication of Rousseau's Little Education Manifesto in Mio, published in 1762. Now, from the point of view of faith, Rousseau's counsels lead to a ruined life. Not very good. He, by the way, had, I think he had five children, and uh, five, he had something like five children with a, a mistress, and he's this rising star in Europe, winning, winning these fabulous prizes. Everyone knows Rousseau. And he's got these kids, and what does he do? And he's writing about education, and he one day decides, I can't handle them anymore, and walks off to an orphan orphanage, opens the door and closes it, and leaves them behind. <laughs> and yet, this man has been probably more influential than anybody else in educational circles over the last 200 years. Well, he bases his educational philosophy, as he tells us, on a novel view of freedom, that children are born without any stain of sin. Now, if there are any unbelievers in the room tonight, let me tell you, if you uh, dare to spend one dinner with me in my household, 
and you're still an unbeliever, thinking that there's no such thing as original sin, then uh, I will pay for your dinner. <laughs> original sin seems to me one of the most obvious uh, facts out there. And yet this is a Rousseau adamantly denied. There's no such thing. There's no problem with man inherently. The problem is outside. We could fix the structures, we could fix the man. If we could fix the teachers, we could fix the boy. According to Rousseau, no longer is the battle of the moral life a combat between vice and virtue. Rather, the true conflict is between authenticity and inauthenticity. Between being outer-directed and inner-directed. The only lesson the child needs to learn is how he or she might be true to his or her natural self. The next quotation, number four. Let's read it together. The truly free man wants only what he can do and does what he pleases. That is my fundamental axiom. It need only be applied to childhood for all the rules of education to flow from it. Amen. <laughs> well, in this romantic view, it's man that is born whole and it's society that corrupts. Man is born happy, hierarchy frustrates. Does this sound familiar to you? In its day, this little book caused a sensation. In Geneva, they burnt it. Uh, the French government, the government confiscated the book and Catholics in a lot of quarters predicted disaster. What we find in Rousseau is an early articulation of the view that freedom is something that is merely to be expressed. It's a good without qualification. A good without qualification. Now at this point, we're halfway through. Are you wondering, this might be true, but what does this have to do with my classroom? Or perhaps, that was 200 and some years ago. Does that really affect us today? That's reasonable. Except, in this case, Rousseau's ideas were for Kant. The thought over of Rousseau still holds sway over, you might say, the village elders, or many of them. Rousseau's great achievement was to establish a new context for debates over pedagogy. Gone was the familiar story of Adam to Christ. In its place was Emile, a child of Eden. Men and women might still seek a blessed return to the garden. They would find it, though, not through faith in the sacraments, but through a return to authenticity. To bring this to the ground, if Rousseau were head of your board of trustees, you need to appoint someone like Jane Fonda as your principal. Be true to yourself. Freedom will make her true. What Rousseau did is awakened in us moderns a religious devotion to the self. And it merely took secular educational theory about 200 years to fill in details. So, our mistrust of authority, our lack of dress codes, our patience from sloth, our excessive devotion to child-centered classrooms, our talk of values clarification can, in large measure, sooner or later, be laid at the feet of Rousseau's disciples of the social sciences and in our classrooms to the likes of John Dewey. Now, even during his own lifetime, Dewey's influence over education in the English-speaking world was enormous. Near the end of his career, he had both the privilege to see the growth of what came to be called as progressive schools, and an opportunity to reflect upon their foundations. In words that would echo Rousseau, in 1938 he articulated his own manifesto, right, he articulated a few of these, but in one of them he contrasted principles of old education with the principles of so-called new education. And this is what he wrote. This is quotation number five. I'll read this. 
suppose I should stay here. To a position from above is opposed expression and cultivation of individuality. To external discipline is opposed to free activity. To learning from texts and teachers, learning through experience. To acquisition of isolated skills and techniques by drill is opposed. Acquisition of them as means of attaining ends which make direct vital appeal. To preparation for a more or less remote future is opposed making the most of opportunities of present life. To static games and materials is opposed to acquaintance with a changing world." End quote. I don't know how that felt ringing through your ears, but I'll confess, the first time I read that, it sounded very slick. It has a, a warm ring to it. Praising individuality and free activities just seems to roll off the tongue. These are good things. I like freedom. You like individuality. And then one stops and thinks about what you've actually read. And you realize the words mean something quite different than they appear on first, at first glance. So let's consider this just for a moment. First of all, Dewey's caricature of 2,500 years of Western educational thoughts and practice is obviously a straw man. Do you imagine that Don Bosco sought techniques by drill for his boys that made no vital appeal? Or that Elizabeth Seaton would lock your daughter away from the changing world so that she could hide there? Must preparation for the remote future mean going to heaven, mean neglect of present life, mean meaning getting a job? I hardly think so. It's a caricature, it's a strong one. Dewey himself was apparently a man of some culture, but unlike most revolutionaries, he never had to sleep in the bed that he made, and he didn't have to teach the kind of students that progressive education would later produce. Dewey, in fact, belonged to that generation of high-minded American liberals who married metaphysical skepticism to political optimism. Somehow, despite the death of God, despite the abyss, science and democracy would make everything turn out okay. Dewey praises individuality and free activity but Dewey does not answer what is the good end of the individual or the good end of his free activity. But freedom without an end is a noun without an object, or like a forest without birds, or a day without sunshine. It's awful. The inconsistency of this approach took some time to appreciate. Consider Dewey's achievement. In his left hand, he stole from educators the foundations for an objective morality. He says, it's not there anymore. It's all up to the individual. All purposes are in flux. Everything is self-generated. At the same time, he substituted with his right hand a new morality of progress in every way as absolute and inflexible as the old one he destroyed. Imagine a village encouraging merely authentic expressions is a society that soon finds itself crowded with the army of counselors, social service agencies, agents, and police officers needed to manage and contain the young people that had set adrift without a rudder. Still, we may wonder. Dewey's educational principles may be flawed, but does that mean we have to go back to the 1950s Catholic classroom? I don't know. I wasn't there. 
the closest I've come in my real experience, in fact, is our priest's retelling of all sorts of interesting stories. He grew up in Philadelphia. And he said that when he was a boy, it was very common to have a hundred kids in the class, if you can imagine. <laughs> It was also very easy to be a naughty boy, as he relates, of his own experience. Cheating and pinching. Anyways, Father Gerber turned out all right. So, do we need to return to Sacred Heart's 1950s classroom? Well, that is a reasonable question and something to explore. I, at least, don't recommend the tacky towels. What happened the floorboards, though? I think, do remain sturdy. The tradition of Catholic education is living and dynamic. This means that while the methods, the settings, and to some extent the curricula of Catholic schools can rightly vary, and should vary over time and place, and there have been some improvements, quite obviously. Nevertheless, the foundations of the school, and, and here I return to my thesis, the purposes that sustain the enterprise they can vary. The drama of heaven and hell, the virtues, the sacraments, the dignity of the person, the mental and moral disciplines all implied by faith, these remain constants on which the Catholic educator must build and draw present inspiration. It takes a village to raise a school, and it's up to us elders to reclaim and restate the aims. And this leads us finally to our second purpose, culture. We're almost done. What is culture? And why do we need it for the school? Briefly, I think a Catholic culture provides the context where in which hands and head are drawn together into a living, vibrant body. That's why we need Catholic culture. One way to think about the crisis of Catholic education is that we're suffering from a failure of transmission. Even when the truths of faith are presented, it's as though we've, we struggle to find ways to make it stick. Probably all of us can think of people from our own families, or maybe prominent politicians, that uh, grew up, uh, believe in God, seem to know something about all the ends. They have impressive moral and intellectual virtues, or at least some of them, and yet in later years they abandon the faith, or at least accept one of its more egregious distortions, such as, I'm not personally for abortion, but these are often very good people, generous, hardworking, open-hearted, Catholic. But somehow they haven't been able to put together the whole picture of Catholicism. Even after 12 years at a Catholic school. Why is that? Why does it happen so frequently? And when does the tapestry of faith for such people begin to unravel? In my experience, it usually happens when they're about 15. Or perhaps when they went to college, or perhaps when they started living with their boyfriend. They simply found themselves surrounded by people without faith and lost themselves. It's not as though they rejected the creed outright, at least not typically. They just sort of wandered out of the Catholic village. And our institutions have a very difficult time hurting them back. Uh, there was a recent study trying to track the stickiness of Catholic culture in now Catholic universities, so not, not K-12, but the next level. And this uh, one national study reported this, that 57% of students at Catholic colleges and universities declared that their experience at college had, quote, no effect on their participation in Mass. No effect. No effect? Not even a little? 
Such failures in transmission point, I think, to our need to link together the ultimate purposes for education with these more immediate purposes. And Catholic culture, I think, is that link. As doctrines die without disciplines, so faith without faithful friends tends to flounder. It takes, we might say, a village. The school is not the church, true, yet however good we are at academics, however pious our intentions, a school without frequent sacraments, without liturgical celebrations, and without a network of pious friends and family, is a school that is simply not likely to succeed in forming a boy or girl into the mind of Christ. Now, before I conclude, I would like to, I am about to conclude, I'd like to reflect briefly on this concept of stickiness. How is it that culture acts to unify your head and your hands, unify your conception of the, the big philosophical ideas and your practical virtues? I have not yet given you a definition of culture, so let's do that. Last citation. Let's read together. Again from Vatican II. The word culture, in its general sense, indicates everything whereby man develops and perfects his many bodily and spiritual qualities. He strives by his knowledge and his labor to bring the world itself under his control. He renders social life, or human, both in the family and in the civic community.
she was struggling with drugs, she had been in and out of rehab, and she was doing better at this moment. She, uh, she was out for a while, which was wonderful. Her will was healing, but her thoughts were still pretty corrupt. During this conversation, we were, we were talking about her life, and I was asking questions particularly about the kinds of ideas that her counselors were introducing to her. Now, I have great respect for counselors. This is not against counseling or counselors. But her counselors were pro promoting a, a, a value-free conception of happiness, kind of like what Rousseau would want. Happiness is following your own path, these people were telling her. So this gal, Lisa, was doing actually not so badly, but she had a boyfriend she was interested to talk about, and her boyfriend happened to be a gangster. So we got talking about him. And eventually, our discussion came around to this question. If values are relative, if it's true that happiness is whatever you want it to be, what's wrong with being a gangster? And we chatted about that for a little while. And I had to clarify, I don't mean what's wrong with being a gangster from the point of view of getting thrown into jail. I don't mean what's bad about getting caught. More, what's wrong with it? Is there anything intrinsically vile about doing what gangsters do? Lisa was pondering this for a moment, and then at the end, she said, yes, I, I have wondered about that, and I don't know what I could say to him. Well, my friends, on Dewey's terms, on Rousseau's terms, there's nothing you can say. In a childhood without moral clues, the self can only fall back upon the self. In a world where life is nothing but a journey, it really does not matter what you set for a destination, guns or no guns. Or as the misfit of Flannery O'Connor's short story puts it, it's nothing for you to do but enjoy the few minutes you've got left the best way you can. And along this way of thinking, it's the child who knows best, not the teacher. So to conclude, as you know, our schools are filled with young men and young women like Lisa, overflowing with boys and girls looking for teachers and mentors who will show them a virtuous and noble mode of life. We'll look to a community where goodness is easy. Why do we need to restate the case for Catholic education? That's simple. Questions of method presume answers about ends. And if we don't learn to defend ours, happiness, culture, virtue, the schools will close. Why else might we need to re learn to restate this case? That too is simple. Someone you love is always going to ask. Thank you very much.